so glad that I didn't get that measurement wrong. Can't have my followers saying that. Hey guys, it's Marty with DPC Technology, uh, back with another video. We are here again at our existing office, uh, obviously still under construction. Today we're gonna talk about fishing wires in a wall. We're gonna go over some tips and tricks on uh, what tools I use to do that and kind of how to do it, as well as what goes into making those decisions. One of the most important things to understand is how a wall is built. Um, that will give you some expectations of where you can cut into the wall, and also knowing where things are mounted inside of a wall and how they're mounted will give you some insight as to, again, where you may be able to cut that hole. One of the most common things everyone's probably heard before is that walls are held up by studs and those studs are typically built 16 inches on center. And what that refers to is that every 16 inches you will find a stud. Now, where's the first stud? That is the, obviously the biggest question because if you knew that, then from there it's really easy. What you'll find is that they typically start at one end of the wall or the other and then build studs every 16 inches. And unless that wall is perfectly divisible by 16, you'll have one void at the end, one to the other, that is a little shorter than the other. It happens to be this void in this particular wall, but that's only because I can look up and see that, that I know that. Otherwise, you're doing some guesswork there. We'll go over some ways to kind of try to find where the studs are and some tricks so that you don't have to avoid patching a hole. One thing that you don't want to have to do, unless you, of course you have the skills, and even then you don't want to do it, is to cut a hole into a wall where there's a stud because then you're gonna have to patch that and that wall will never look as good as it did before unless you're really good at doing drywall repair work. Going back into the wall construction though, what you'll see, every wall is gonna have a piece of sheetrock on each side and you got studs in the middle. Most walls will have some level of insulation in it, uh, particularly if it's a, a residential wall. However, if it's commercial, sometimes they won't do that because they really don't need to uh, have a need for it. Depending on whether or not there's insulation on that wall will depend on what tool I prefer to use and we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, so before we get started, just a couple of tools here that I'm gonna be using to make this happen. Just a quick little small bullet level, a drywall saw or a keyhole saw, tape measure because I wanna make sure that it's done at the right height, an old workbox because we will put this in the wall when we're done, but I'm gonna use it as a template for right now. And then a Sharpie so that once we define where we want our box and we've verified that everything is going to work where it is, we'll actually trace that nice square rectangle and then cut it out with this drywall saw. Just want to mention that I actually have no intention of using a stud finder today. And while I completely realize it takes away from multiple good jokes, puns there, um, I'm not be going to mention it because I don't use a stud finder. Um, there are some other specialty tools, uh, magnets, uh, I know there's a little app with a camera, and you know, we have used some of those things. Um, yeah, but the reality is that they, they, they're an additional tool that I have to keep track of, that I have to purchase, um, you know, in, I've got multiple technicians that have those same things. It's other stuff. Those costs aren't a big deal, but you know, stud finders need batteries. They, there's just other additional things that I, I just don't want to have to worry about. And the reality is, over time, when I've used those, at least in the past, I have falsely had confidence and then cut into a wall and hit a stud, or you know, hit a pipe or a conduit, something that that stud finder didn't see or didn't find uh, for whatever reason. And so I just stopped using them. Um, I haven't used a stud finder in, I can't tell you how long. I mean, I've been technically fishing cable for probably over 20 years at this point, and I haven't used a stud finder, I mean, at least a decade, I don't know, more, more than that. Um, there's also the classic, you know, knock trick, classic trick your dad probably taught you growing up there, but uh, I don't really utilize it either. I, I truly just kind of do it this way every time because it works for me. Um, and again, you know, as I'll describe, if I were to mess this up, the way I'm messing it up is this little teeny tiny hole that I fill with a little bit of spackle. I mean, it's, it's pretty bulletproof, and that's all there is to it. Let's get into it. All right, so the first trick is if you look at a wall, you will almost always see that there's some electrical outlet somewhere on this wall. And what you will find is that electrical outlet is almost always directly attached to a stud. So that's just the first cheat code right there. This particular wall is a really good gotcha. And we'll walk around the backside here and see why. But you notice that there are two outlets here. And a very common thing to do is to put an outlet on each side of a stud. And that is one of the first things I'll actually assume is happening. So if we look down at this stud right here, you see two, to, two boxes right side by side. And so one would assume there's a stud right here. At least that would be my first guess. And I would guess at 16 inches from there will be another stud and, and so on. So we'll go off of that assumption, but I'll go ahead and give you a sneak peek in the future if you walk around this wall real quick. So in this particular instance, they didn't actually mount the boxes on both sides of the stud. They have a support beam going across in that void. Now, again, they wouldn't do, typically do this and mount the boxes in the middle of the wall, but they could. So 
you can't always just assume that this way they do it one way is the way they're always going to do it. So let's go back around the other wall and I'm going to act as if that was my assumption from the get go and I'll show you how it'll actually on purpose still be okay. All right, so on this wall, like I said, I'm going to purposely do this under the assumption there is a stud here to show you just one thing that I do that will save you a mess up. Now, we'll take this void between these two boxes and assume it's a stud. And say I want a box roughly over in this region right here. What I'm going to do is, well, that is far enough for me to assume it's two studs away. And right there at 32 inches is where I'm going to assume that next stud is. So if my finger is right here, that means there should be a stud here. So I'm gonna cheat it this way and put my box up here and act as if that is where we're going to go. And I'll show you how I cut that box in so that we can avoid doing any more damage than we absolutely have to. All right, so one of the most important thing about putting these boxes in is obviously if I put it right next to this one, it'd make sense to you, but you don't want it to be the wrong height. You don't want it to be goofy. So what I would do is measure the existing boxes. There is, this is pretty standard. Typically the boxes are 16 inches to center or 18 inches roughly to that top hole, but whatever it may be in your particular house or your particular business, I would use that instead of trying to change the standard because it'll just look out of place. So for this one, looks like they're 16 inches on center or roughly 17 and five eighths to that top hole, something like that. So I'll make a mark over here <clears throat> at that same height. And I'm just gonna hold that in place with my finger for right now. And you certainly can use a pencil for this stuff, but I make little small marks that I can see that aren't gonna matter in the end. Now that that is my top hole mark, what I will do <clears throat> is I will use this old work box. Now this is a low voltage old work box, AKA there is no back on it because I don't have any uh, reason to meet some level of code. But this top hole right there is gonna be the same screw hole that this one is. And so if I put it against the wall in reverse and eyeball this hole to this top hole, I should have this thing perfectly lined up aside from the fact I need to get it level. So we're going to do that real quick. Okay, so that is theoretically level. That top hole should be aligned with those over there. So what I'm gonna do from here is start a cut. And this is where I was getting at before is, you don't wanna immediately just cut this entire old work box out in case you're wrong. Another reason why I don't like marking on the wall, you know, pencil is fine, but if you use pen and then you put it in the wrong spot, you're gonna to have to at least paint over it. So one thing we can do here is we know up and down, typically speaking, should be fine. Obviously there could be cross braces in the wall, but it, that is just a whole other situation. If you're trying to cut into this wall, we need to go as far left as this side and as far right as that side. So we could literally just pop a hole in here and if we hit something, AKA a stud, we'd stop there and that'd be the biggest hole we have, right? But if we were clear there, what we can do is we can go left and we can go right and check the bounds of our box. And if we do that, we realize that we've got the width to make this happen. And at that point, then I would trace this out and actually draw it out with a pencil or a pen, whatever, so you know that you can get a good, nice straight uh, cut but you know that you're not ever gonna have to cover this up with paint or anything like that because you can put this box here. So I'm gonna grab my pencil and we'll go ahead and mock that up real quick. All right, so now that we're officially doing this, I'm gonna come here and mark 17 and 5 eighths because that is where I measured on that side as the top hole. <clears throat> go ahead and take this, don't get confused by this very top hole. This hole is the uh, one that a screw plate or a finishing plate will screw into and that's what we're looking for over here. If I put this on that dot, grab my level, and get things level while that dot is still there. These particular ones have a little dot in the four corners. And so what I like to do is just make my dots and then come back and use a level because uh, it's not so much about this piece being level as it is just a solid straight edge. And then once we have our box drawn out, obviously we can just finish cutting it. Now, one thing I like to do is kind of knock my corners out because that does take a little bit of an impact. And if you don't cut your corners first, or at least before you're done with most of your long cuts, what you'll do is as you're sawing, you'll end up tearing the paper because you'll get to a corner, and you're gonna pull back and it'll tear the paper as opposed to actually cutting it. All right. And so then what we have and we're all said and done is a hole, right? Now, obviously, you could ask, you know, I got lucky there, we didn't hit any studs, but we would have caught that when we were doing our test cuts left and right. 
Now, once I have this void, you saw I did guess wrong over here, as in I made the assumption there was a stud there and we all know there is not, but it still worked out because we checked our bounds before we cut the full box. Now that I have the box, I do want to try to identify where the stud is because when it comes to fishing a cable down the wall, or better yet, when it comes to fishing the fish tape up the wall, I will try to use that stud. I will lean against that stud, if you will. If there's insulation in the wall, the insulation will tend to pin the fish tape between the insulation and the wall, kind of holding it in place. But if the void is open and just no insulation, like this particular void happens to be, at least at the moment, then you, when you run a fish tape up in this void, it'll have a tendency to just fall over and collapse in the wall. We'll have a shot that shows that later. But for right now, what I'll do is I'll reach, reach my hand in here and I can't feel anything this way because it's so far over there. However, if I reach this way, I can immediately feel that stud. So I'm going to know my stud to the right is closer. And so when I fish, I'll tend to lean my fish cable, my fish tape rather, just in that general direction so that there's something for that tape to lean against and gravity doesn't just let it fall over. Okay, now that we have our hole cut, time for the fish tape. So like I said, there's a couple different types of fish tapes or a couple different tools you can use for fishing. Uh, this is just a metal fish tape. Anytime I'm doing just straight up drywall, uh, I will try to use a metal fish tape. There's nylon fish tape. Those are mainly, uh, you know, utilized for fishing a conduit. Um, so something that's existing. And there also are fish sticks. I typically use fish sticks for running cable over distances. Like once I'm up in the ceiling, I'm running it back to home. Uh, I'll use fish sticks just to kind of skip more often ceiling tiles, you know, something like that. Or uh, even if I was in the attic, I'd kind of use it just to spear throw it. Uh, not really, but you know, just to make things move a little faster. You could use a fish stick in this wall. I would never use a fish stick in a wall that has insulation. So if I was going to use a fish stick in a wall, this would be the wall. And the reason for that is so that, again, this fish tape doesn't fall over. We'll see if it does. Uh, matter of fact, I will actually try to make it fall over just so you guys can see what I'm referring to there. But uh, let's just kick it off. Like I said, fish tape, when I run this in, I'm gonna run it closer to this side because I know that's where the stud is. And I'm gonna hope that it kind of rides along that wall as I fish it up. Literally just as easy as fishing it. And as you can see up the wall, we're all the way at the top of this void. If you are in a, in a residential situation, obviously more of an attic. In a commercial situation, you're gonna have more of a drop ceiling. That's what you typically find. It is easier uh, when you're dealing with uh, drop ceiling because you can kind of pop a ceiling tile and cut into the side of the wall to access the line you fished up. Whereas if you're in a true attic, you may have to drill down top uh, to the top of the header to access this, in which case you may fish back down, you may fish up, you may play games and try to find that cable. But generally speaking, it's all the same thing. You're gonna cut an entry point and an exit point or another entry point, and you're gonna try to get to that spot. Once you're through that spot, we're going to tape our cable on and pull down. All right, so just some quick info on when you tape this, and this may sound uh, very, very basic and maybe even obvious, but when you go to pull things through walls, if you have any kind of issues uh, with, you know, drag, you have something in the wall that this thing can catch on, it will. It just, it's going to happen. So what you want to do is minimize that ability um, to stop, get caught, snag on anything. So first and foremost, you don't want to tape like this because when you go to pull down, you're going to be pulling it against each other. So you want to tape in line with your tape. I typically overlap by, I don't know, four inches, six inches, something like that. You can go as you know short as you want, but the reality is the less you have in here, the less you can tape, and therefore, if you do get caught on something, you may put a little extra energy on it, pull, and you could pull this out of the tape. What I do, like I said, tape it in line, and I start at the end of the wire, and just tape kind of a spiral going down the wire. What I wanted to do is cover the end of that fish tape because you saw that fish tape had kind of a hook on it. Then pull a little bit extra off, tear it, fold over the end, and roll it around. The reason I do this is because, yes, this is an easy pull tab. You could tape the side and go that way, same thing, not really a big deal, but the most important thing is you don't want there to be something that as you're dragging or pulling, it stops and hits and catches regardless of which direction it is. Just, you want this to be as smooth as possible. And then once you're taped on, obviously you're ready to just pull your fish tape and this should stay pretty tight. You can see that I have to pull it decently hard to get that out of there. Now obviously I was able to get it out of there, but if you're pulling something that hard, you're gonna know it and odds are you may have to pull this off one time and redo it. What I typically do is I don't get crazy with the tape because 99, out of 10, 99 times out of 100, you don't have this issue. And if you do, I usually just fish it again because it's no big deal, we'll tape it much better. Okay, 
So now in the scenario that we do need to pull really hard on this cable, uh, that's typically something that uh, you know, you're going in a conduit. If it's raw on the wall and you're caught, you're probably gonna tear the cable. Where I find this is, like I said, in a conduit. If I got a really long conduit and it's snaking, taking 90 degree turns and things like that, then it's a matter of uh, making sure that I have the ability to pull in this cable without pulling it off. So I will do a lot more than my first assessment there of like just four inches. I'll double that up, triple that up, something like that. Because at the end of the day, you know, I can cut a foot, but I can't stretch an inch, right? So <clears throat> line this up and wrap this wire around there a little bit. So now I've got this wire wrapped in that, around here, and then I will tape it. And I will make sure that it stays in this because not only will it be taped much, much more, but it'll have that wrap around there. And when it goes to pull, it can't come undone. It just, it just typically can't. If you get your entire body weight on this, like I have before, maybe you can. And in that scenario, you probably have bigger issues. But like I said, you just take that wire, wrap it around there as is. And once it's on there, I don't have to get every inch of this taped. It, it doesn't really matter that much. A little tab on there again, and bam. This wire is much more difficult, but I can pull it off. You'll see that any amount of force at some point, you're going to be able to pull that off. If you're looking for a, hey, is there a way to make this so that I literally cannot pull this wire off? You do have this hook right here, right? So you could just thread this through here and fold it back. And that would then roll this tape over in of itself. And you could pull like that. That's another possibility. The issue with this one is if you're running more than one cable, it's kind of hard to get that all those cables in there. You also end up kind of bulking up a conduit or a wall if you um, needed to have the clearance. This makes it a little more difficult, but they're all options. Just be aware that there's not necessarily just one way to do it. There are different ways to do it, and it just depends on what you're dealing with. If I run, you know, running 40 cables today, I'm going to do it the easy way first just because it takes me less time. And I won't go crazy on taping things up or doing them more structural unless I start to have issues over and over again because of the way they ran conduit or the wire running or you know, whatever reason it may be. At the end of the day, I am trying to be quick with it. All right, so now that we have that cable taped on, then all we have to do is pull that guy back and we should be able to pull that cable all the way down and through. Bam, there it is. And like we just said, because if you tape it in this particular way, you're able to easily get this off. And bam, this cable has been run. It's now time to put in the old work box. All right, so now we'll cover a couple of different issues that you may run into and ways to solve them. The first one is just the classic, like I said, if you don't go against the side that has a stud or if somehow you cut right in the middle of the void and there's no insulation back there, you have the ability for this tape just to fall over on itself. So not sure I can make this happen, but we'll see if it happens. I'm gonna purposely kind of fish towards the left so it has more of an ability to do so. All right, and so don't know if you guys heard that, but it just fell over on itself. And so no matter how much I push in here, it's probably gonna continue just rolling over. You see actually up there, if you do look, you can see where it's rolled over. And so if you had the ability to grab that, you'd still be okay. But you'll see from the other camera angle that it fell over on itself and it's just stuck in the wall. Um, sometimes you have that and this coil will actually just continue coiling, especially if you had to get access to your cable from higher up. And because it has that ability to sit there and coil, you'll just never get it. You'll just fill this wall, fill a fish shape, and you'll never get it. The easiest trick to do there is, is A, use gravity as your friend and just fish from the top to the bottom once you've got your hole cut, or B, use a fish stick. So I'll grab a set of fish sticks and show you that that is just easier because the rigidity of that stick will make it so that it cannot fall over. All right, so we've got fish sticks here. These come in little, I don't know, what is this, four foot length? Uh, something like that. Obviously you screw them together so you can make them long. You can get a kit with as many of them as you want. But the point of this is they are rigid, but flexible. So if I take this, stuff it in this hole, <clears throat> one thing you gotta be careful about just so you're not damaging the top of the hole that you've cut here, right? Is to kind of manage the stick in there and get it to turn because it's gonna hit the back of the other wall and you want it to ride up that wall. So just to get it started, kind of get your hand in there, give it some port, put a bend in it and get it sliding. It gets caught on something, pull it back. Just, it should pretty much just glide up to the top of the wall. And you can see there it is. So we'll tape our cable onto that, pull it right back down, and bam, same story over again. One thing that I do like about the fish sticks is if you run into the scenario that we all hate as anyone who's ever fished anything in a wall, 
is if you hit a cross brace. If you use a fish stick, you're gonna hit that same cross brace. But there's some flexibility in that stick and you don't know if that's what you're really hitting or if you just happen to be hitting something on one side of the wall. But with a fish stick, I can tell you where I am in this wall because, oh, there I am, pull my hand out. Again, I could do this on a fish tape, but I can tell you that my stick made it this far up the wall. And so if I actually got caught at this height, there's a chance there's a cross brace in the wall. Now, usually that's because uh, maybe there's cabinetry on this wall that has a purpose for having extra uh, structure built into the wall. Now, sometimes that two by four is actually not <clears throat> laying horizontal uh, or laying flat. It is actually laid up on its edge. And the only reason I bring that up is because if it's up on its edge, that void actually still has an opening. So if the stud was on its edge and against that back wall back there, you're gonna ride up this hole, ride up this hole and against that back wall and you'll hit that stud. But if it's not on that entire void, what you could do is reach your hand in here and push that fish stick and try to keep it on this side of the wall and you'd be able to go past it. Now, in the event that it is a true just cross brace, there is a horizontal stud in there that's laying flat. <clears throat> what I usually do is use this to gauge my distance away. So say it got stuck right here, I would just, oh, there's my height. I would then pull this out, hold it up to this hole, and I would know the height of my cross brace. The reason is because there are a couple of ways to deal with these cross braces. Maybe I just go to another void and try all over again and hope that there isn't a cross brace there. But if I go to another void, I've already got to patch this hole anyways. So <clears throat> one thing that I do, if I absolutely have to, and I've already cut this hole, is now that I know where the cross brace is, I can just cut an access hole above it and below it. And now that I have that access hole, I can take a chunk out of that stud. I can take, get a drill fit in there and drill through it, whatever it may be. And so then I can thread the needle, if you will, right? I will have to patch these holes, but if my other option is simply patching this hole and moving over, I may be patching that hole only to find I've got the same thing happening over there. So fingers crossed, if this ever happens to you, you only have one cross brace. You don't have to continue doing it, but that is a cheat code for you. All right, so now that we have our wire ran, last thing there is to do is to put our box in the wall. Now we'll have to terminate it after we're done and put a faceplate on it, but for right now, I just wanna show you how to install this little, little low voltage box. <clears throat> you literally just slide it over you're working on. Obviously, don't forget that you have to thread this through that box. Slap it in there, and it's pretty much gonna be in place. So I'm gonna run these screws almost tight. I usually put my finger behind here and feel the tab as it gets closer so I don't over tighten it. And the reason I say I'm getting it almost tight is because I wanna make final uh, you know, last minute adjustments with my level so that it is perfectly level. And so now that I've got that close, I got it butted up again, had the box butted against my level, and I'm just bumping it to get it dialed in. And bam. Uh, now, if you guys aren't familiar what these little screws are doing, there's this little winged out tab. And so when you tighten the screw, it whips the wing out so that it is out behind the drywall and then screws it in tighter so that it sandwiches the drywall together. And that's all you need to hold that in place. At this point, you would obviously terminate your wire, depending on what kind of wire it is, but this is a Cat6 cable. You just put a keystone jack on it, snap it into a faceplate, slide it up here, and screw your faceplate into your two holes, and it'll cover all this up. And that's all there is to it. All right, guys, so I appreciate you hanging out with us today. You know, if you have any questions about how you might fish a wire in a different way or a different scenario, I'd be curious to hear about it, or maybe any other tricks or tools that you have up your sleeve, please let us know in the comments below. Uh, as always, like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.